much for coming out this evening. Um, I think if I were you and it was such a beautiful evening, I wouldn't be here. So I really appreciate you uh, making the effort to be here to listen to what uh, what we're doing at the centre and um, for to give me an opportunity to share some of the um, the findings that we have from our research. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for this evening's event. I really appreciate being here. Um, it's great. Um, I know that they've gone to a lot of uh, effort behind the scenes, so it's, it's uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge, um, I work in, uh, at the national level um, and internationally as well. The person who does the work here uh, is Andrew Spring. So if you have any questions specific to the Northwest Territories, Andrew's the lead researcher here. So um, he's the guy to talk to if you have specific questions about the projects that, that are happening here in the territory. And we are also very lucky to have uh, Carla working with us this summer as well. She's uh, at Ecology North and she's doing some work there on the Yuc uh, sorry, the uh, Yellowknife Food Charter. So we've got a couple of uh, people from our research network here, which is great. So um, what I'd like to do first of all is just to start off by talking a little bit about some of the research projects that we have. We have some, uh, we've been engaged in some research projects with the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which is the national funding body for the kind of work that, uh, that happens um, through the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. We've been engaged in a, a project on the social and informal economy of food for, uh, we're going into our third year. And last year we got a big uh, grant to do five years of research on um, a project called FLEDGE. FLEDGE stands for Food, Locally Embedded, Globally Engaged. So it's all about trying to figure out what's happening in local communities and how we can build networks both across Canada and internationally. So within Canada, we have seven research nodes. One of them's here um, in the Northwest Territories. And as I said, Andrew is the lead researcher um, in that node. But we also have a node down in British Columbia and Alberta. We have another um, node in Southern Ontario, one in Eastern and one in Northern Ontario. Uh, we have a node in uh, Quebec, and we also have one out in the Atlantic provinces. So we're almost pan-Canadian. We're working on the prairie still. That's the gap in our map. But uh, we're trying to fill that uh, as we go into our, our next years of work. So, um, so just to talk a little tiny bit about some of the work that's going on here up um, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, as with all our work, it's community focused. Um, some of the work that's been happening uh, looks at issues around climate change adaptation and food security planning. So the goal here is to try to understand more about community needs in terms of adapting to what's happening to country food and traditional food based on uh, the changing climate and all of the things that that uh, impacts, including the changing landscapes that communities have to deal with. We're also interested in this idea of knowledge transfer and sharing, and you're going to hear a lot about that in my talk because that's one of the things that we put a, a big premium on. Um, we're exploring opportunities for uh, food production, which many of you in this room are involved in one way or another in producing food or in getting food from uh, people who grow it into the hands of community members. So how many people here uh, are involved in a farmer's market or some way of getting food out to people in the community. Okay, cool. How many people here grow food? All right, okay, good. So you're, you've got a lot of uh, interesting things going on. Uh, so if you have any things that you'd like to share, please uh, jump in. That, it'd be good to hear your experiences. Um, as I said, uh, Carla is working on the Yellowknife Food Charter. So um, that's uh, a new initiative, as you will all know, so I don't need to tell you about that. And we're also interested in exploring different dimensions of territorial uh, policy. So one of the things that I like to do uh, when I'm giving a talk like this is just to sort of talk about what we mean by sustainable food systems when we're talking about, because the Center for Sustainable Food Systems and Sustainable Food Systems Research and all that kind of thing. So these are the words that we always try to aim for. So we're looking for a food system that's green, so there's an environmental um, dimension to it, that it's fair, so there's a social justice dimension, that it's local as much as possible. So we're looking to relocalize or localize food systems as much as that makes sense. And we're also looking for engagement. Um, 
making the food system more, democrat more democratic and for engaging uh, citizens as much as possible. And when we talk about a food system, um, what we're really looking at here are all the different pieces that fit together to bring food from um, either from the water or from uh, where it's being harvested, um, being gathered, or where it's being grown, all the way through to the waste heap. So we're really interested in trying to understand how that system works and how we can make it um, a more resilient system that works uh, as well as possible for everybody um, involved. So this is an amazing photo from this morning. I got to be in Kikisa for the last couple of days and this is from a planting, a garden planting, a community garden planting we did this morning where remarkably in addition to putting in berry plants and planting tomatoes and all, uh, cabbage and celery and all kinds of other plants, a, cello, a cellist showed up <laughs> and serenaded us while we were uh, planting the garden with the kids this morning. So that was pretty an amazing experience and really that captures the absolute ideal of what our research process is all about because when we're doing our research what we're trying to do is engage communities so it's participatory it's action driven and it's also community driven so we're very much about having communities define the kind of uh, research that they want to have done and facilitating that process uh, one of the ways that we do that is we have advisory committees in um, each of our communities and they help to shape the research questions that we ask um, when we're out in the field uh, supporting different communities. So it's very much a bottom-up kind of initiative. Um, and one of the projects that I'm going to be talking to you about uh, in a few minutes is our Food Hub project in Ontario. I was asked uh, this evening to address some things that come from outside the territory to sort of speak about some of the research that we've had going on for a while. But first of all, what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you about a few definitions. So the first one is the definition of personal or household food security. And this is a more recent definition. Um, it was originally uh, written in 1996 and it's gone through a few iterations. But what's really important about this is the inclusiveness so all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to food. So it's not just having enough food but it's having the kind of food that you need to eat based on your culture. So that's really important. Um, that it's safe, that's, that's also important obviously, that there's enough of it so it's consumed in sufficient qu quantity and quality to meet dietary needs and food preferences, and that it's done in a way that's sustainable. So that's the definition of personal or household food security. So that, that was first, that idea first developed in the 1990s. By the early 2000s, people started to realize that we needed to think beyond household or personal food security to think about the community and what food security meant for community. So as you can see from this definition, um, again, there's cultural acceptability, nutritional dimensions to it, but there's also this idea of community self-reliance and social justice. So there's another layer that's been added that speaks to the needs of communities and groups of people as opposed to sort of that atomizing effect of the definition that we started with uh, in the 1990s. And then most recently, uh, starting in around 2007, at the Nialeni, um, the meetings in Nialeni, the Via Campesina, how many people here are familiar with the Via Campesina? Okay. So it's a group of, um, they call themselves uh, peasants, but Campesina is a peasant. Um, and it's a group of people around the world who work together towards this goal of food sovereignty. And food sovereignty is really the right to determine what kind of food you eat and where it comes from. And the reason that this definition is so important is because we have a food system globally or internationally that tends to work against people being able to feed themselves what they would like to have. We have this globalized international food system that really tries to make food the same for everybody. Right? We ship food all around the world, we don't respect seasonality, um, we, we sell too much processed, highly processed food that relies on sugar and salt, and it's not a healthy food system anymore. So this was an, an attempt to try and raise the issues associated with the industrial food system that we have. So in order to do that, this is a, a diagram that was developed by Cornelia Flora, 
um, and her husband and a colleague of theirs. And this is the version from 2004. So what this talks to is really all of the different pieces that you would need to have to create this healthy ecosystem that has a vital economy and um, attends to social well-being. So all of these different factors play into that. So there's cultural dimensions, uh, nature, the things that we build, the infrastructure, the money part of the system, the politics, the society, and then what we know as people. So human capital are interrelationships as well. So that's sort of a bit of a primer on the work that we do and where we're coming from. And what I'd like to do now is share some stories with you about some of the work that we've done. Um, so what I'd like to do first of all is, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, some of the work that we've done in Ontario centers around this idea of a food hub. And a food hub, when we first started studying this idea, people wanted it to be a place and they wanted it to be something very specific. And we really pushed back against that and said, well, a food hub can really be whatever the community needs it to be. It's a place where food is gathered together and then distributed out in some way. So uh, we pushed back against this very restrictive definition of it has to be a particular place or a kind of special kind of thing. And we came up with this uh, definition instead. So the way that we think about food hubs is that they can be actual physical spaces, that's fine, but they can also be virtual spaces. And I'm gonna talk to you about um, an initiative that we have called the Open Food Network um, that we're just launching now through uh, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, so it's this place where food gets uh, collected and then shared with people, with uh, restaurants, with um, retailers. But it can also be, and this is one of the things that we found in the research that we've done, it can also be places where food is prepared, where education takes place. So um, Nifty, for example, is a good, potentially a good example of, um, of a food hub in the do education, right? They gather together food and then they distribute it out in lots of ways, but they also do education. So um, one of the things that we're looking at when we're talking about food hubs, and one of the reasons that they're interesting is because of this challenge that we're all facing now called climate change. And um, one of the things that food hubs can do is reduce the distance that food travels. So when we think about this globalized industrial food system, one of the numbers that has been, that gets shared around a lot and has been shared since the mid-1990s um, is that the average food molecule travels 2,100 kilometers or 1,500 miles to get to your plate. Um, and another important thing to note, because one of the things that people talk a lot about when they're talking about our globalized food system and they're trying to justify more technological interventions is they say, well, there isn't enough food to feed everybody. And, I, and that's just not true. So don't let anybody tell you that. We have more than enough food in the world to feed everybody right now, 2,700 kilocalories a day at least. Um, and we have enough food to feed everybody into the future. Um, right now we waste between a third and a half of the food that's grown because it, it gets lost um, throughout the food system. So it's very important to understand that as, as a sort of a background piece of information um, to this talk. But it's also important because if we keep food more localized, we waste less of it, we use it more efficiently, and it's just a better system in terms of climate change because we're not creating all these greenhouse gases, okay? Uh, so that's the idea of shorter food chains. Um, and the other thing that food hubs can do is help to increase people's understanding about what a localized food system's about, why it's beneficial, and how it can help make or provide better quality food to people. What I'm gonna do now is share a couple of case studies with you. So uh, this is the first example that I thought would be of interest to you, and it's called the Niagara Local Food Co-op, as you can see on the slide. Um, what's interesting here is it started off as a fairly small uh, co-op, so it's member-owned. Uh, member it's a producer-consumer cooperative, so it's a cooperative between farmers and eaters. Um, and it's an online farmer's market. <coughs> so how many he people here are familiar with the concept of a virtual farmer's market? No? Okay. Um, the way a virtual farmer's market works is farmers go 
online and tell people what they have to sell that week or in a two-week period. The site closes to the farmers, so the window closes for the farmers. Then the window opens up for the people who want to buy the food. So anybody who's a co-op member can then go online and order whatever food they want from whichever farmer. So you can get your green onions from this person and your beets from this person and your eggs from here and whatever you want. And you put together a box and the site totals up how much money you owe the system. And the orders are distributed to all the farmers. The farmers will come to a special uh, delivery location. It's usually a church or a community center of some kind. And people come with their checks or their cash. They pick up their box and off they go. So that's a virtual farmer's market. So there's lots of advantages to that. First of all, it's, it's really efficient. Um, it gets good healthy food into people's hands very efficiently. Uh, this particular project started off in 2007 with one, um, with one drop-off location, and now they're up to seven, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to give you the wrong numbers there, so just let me. They have over 300 customers. Um, they have 19 producers and 16 processors. So local processors who are making sausages or uh, canned fr you know, fruits in jars or things like that. So, um, and the way that the administration for this project is, is um, covered is through a 10% uh, additional charge on top of the, the reasonable price of food, and then that money is used to pay the administrator. So it's a self-funding project, which is really important because one of the things that's challenging oftentimes for these community projects is that they can't fund themselves and they rely on grants, and it becomes very difficult to keep the momentum going. So this is an interesting model because they are self-funding. Um, so it's a bi-weekly box, um, and as they point out, this is a, a quotation from the coordinator, um, it's, it, it's also an opportunity to educate people about seasonality of food and where their food comes from. So this is called the Open Food Network, and this is a project that we're piloting through the Center for Sustainable Food Systems, and this is a version of what's happening at the Niagara Local uh, Food Co-op. So if you're interested in getting more information about this, um, we've just brought this to Canada in, as of December, January. There's a postdoctoral fellow working on this project through the centre. Um, her name is Teresa Schomelis. This is her email address. If you would like more information about this um, project, so it's Dear Supermarket, it's over, I'm breaking up with you. P.S. I've met someone online. <laughs> So uh, you can get in touch with Teresa and she can give you more information about how to become involved in this project and you can think about whether it's the kind of thing that might make sense for you. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be an online farmer's market only, it could be a way of uh, tracking the food that's being used or it, there's a lot of different ways that this, uh, this platform can be used. So uh, if you're interested at all, give her a, um, get in touch with her by email. Okay, so the second example that I'd like to share with you is Plan B. And by the way, the, uh, the bracketed names are the names of the, the master's students who have worked on these projects. So we've had a number of master's students over the last few years. Um, this is an interesting model. How many people here know what a community-supported agriculture project is? Okay, so I'm going to go through this one a little bit quickly. Community-supported agriculture is fantastic because what it does is it allows the farmer or the person who's producing the food or providing food to spread the risk across all of the people who buy shares. So what happens is in the springtime, before planting, before the farmer has to go out and make all the investment to get their farm up and running, um, they sell shares uh, in their farm and then they have enough cash to get them through the growing season and beyond. And during the growing season, the people who belong to this, the Community Supported Agriculture Project, they get food all summer long. So sometimes, depending on where you are, a season might be 10 weeks or 12 weeks or 14 weeks. Um, many times CSAs stretch their growing season by using hoop house greenhouses and things like that, passive solar greenhouses and that kind of thing. So this is another way of having a shorter distance relationship between the people who provide the food and the people who eat the food, okay? Uh, this is particularly interesting because it's not just, most CSAs are one farm. 
But this is a bunch of people working together, a bunch of farmers who, col who collaborate with one another and provide a suite of different vegetables. And the other thing that they do is they provide vegetables and fruits and uh, vegetables, but also eggs and some meat all year round because they access things through um, other means. So whenever uh, in the winter time, we have some things that we can get access to through greenhouses and things. And, um, you know, uh, I belong to a winter CSA and this year in January we had spinach because they had planted the spinach in a hoop house um, greenhouse and they had just let it sit there and then by the, they decided to leave it for weeks at a time and harvested it in January. So we had spinach in January and they don't heat their greenhouse. Um, I'm not sure how that would work here. Yeah. Where is this? Uh, it's in Waterloo. So it's Gray Perth, uh, Huron County is where the farm is, yeah. But there's, there's lots of really cool growing techniques that uh, uh, Donald Coleman, what's his first name? I always forget his name, okay. Elliot. Elliot, thank you, thank you, here we go, okay. Um, has for, uh, for stretching out growing seasons. So um, this is interesting because it offers uh, versatility to people who want different things in their box, right? Because the farmer, this farm, when they, when they first started growing food for people, they realized that they were good at doing certain things. Their soil was good for certain things, but it wasn't good for other things. But there are other farmers who could grow whatever it was that was missing in the box. So by joining forces, they have a much better, more diverse product line to offer people, and it allows them to offer food all year round. So in terms of benefits for the people growing the food, um, it gives them an, a, a reliable income, but it's also interesting for small scale farmers because they don't have to do all the marketing and everything. Plan B, the core farm does that for them. And in terms of farm workers, depending on the season, they have people, um, it, it employs everybody in their family, so it provides income for three farmers who live at Plan B, but it also provides um, income all year round for one other person and seasonal income for up to eight people. So it's an interesting local economic development model as well as being a really cool way to get your food. Okay. Um, so what's interesting about this as well is it's created a network of farms in a community that work together and help each other learn about how to farm, how to produce food, and how to market, and how to, um, how to teach people in their communities about food as well. And they see themselves as this jumping off point. And what they imagine is that ultimately in Ontario, and this is something that might be relevant for here as well, is that there would be a bunch of these little nodes. So there would be Plan B with all its farms, but there would be many of them throughout the province. So maybe that's something to consider. Uh, for here. I'm not sure if that's relevant or not. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to this project really quickly. Um, it's called Project Soil, which stands for Shared Opportunities on Institutional Land. This project is run by a postdoc who's worked with um, the Centre for a number of years. Um, he's now working for Just Food in Ottawa and a professor at Carleton University who also used to work with the center. And this is taking institutional land, so land that, that is associated with hospitals, uh, mental health or addiction facilities, um, so like CAMH in Toronto or the Homewood in Guelph, um, schools, uh, uh, for-profit companies, anybody that has a piece of land that they're not using. Because what's one of the biggest problems in terms of growing food? Land, exactly. Yeah, it's access to land. And when you look at a map, like I, I don't know if there would be, well, of course there would be aerial maps of around here. You probably notice that institutions tend to have land, right? And that land tends to be grass. A lot of the time I kind of notice some of that walking over here. <laughs> um, and that's land that can be used to grow food. And it's land that farmers can use, young farmers, whoever, any kind of farmers could use to produce an income for themselves as well. So this is, an uh, this is a project that's been looking at piloting these different kinds of ideas. 
Um, these are some of the benefits that they found. So it gives people in the institutions access to fresh food. Um, there's also uh, some kind of revenue generation opportunities so the people who are farming can sell. So what usually happens, and this is not in all the cases, but what usually happens is there's, uh, for example, a hospital that has some grass that gets, and like a big, maybe an acre or so of land that gets cultivated into a garden. And the farmer then sells whatever it is that he or she is growing to the cafeteria or food services people in that institution. So there's a revenue generating opportunity for the people growing the food. There is a skills development um, dimension as well, but there's also a therapeutic opportunity because oftentimes if it's not farmers who are selling all the produce, they're, they're generating income in other ways, maybe they're being paid by the hospital or the, um, the treatment center, because the people who are in that facility are going out in the garden and they're deriving benefit from working on in the land because in many cases it, it adds a lot of value to people's lives to be able to grow food. So there's this therapeutic dimension to having these gardens. Uh, it reduces ground maintenance costs. Uh, it provides education about food. And there's also aesthetic benefits. Obviously this is a beautiful thing to look at, right? Um, there's been research done that in hospitals if you have people looking out at a flat roof and then you take that flat roof and you plant it in flowers or food, the people get better faster. So there's this therapeutic dimension to having these kinds of gardens on the property. And then of course there's community outreach, right? Because you get people, in some cases, people from the community come into the garden to work in the garden, or there's been cases uh, where the quality of the food has improved so much that people from the community actually come to the hospital to eat the food. Which, can you imagine that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, that's hard to believe, eh? <laughs> but that, that has actually happened. So, uh, so if you're interested in this Project Soil, they have a website. Um, I'm going to give you my email address at the end, so you're welcome to get in touch with me if you have any questions about this. So some of the common problems that we've run into in our research, and you may, these may ring some, um, this may sound familiar to you as well, is there's a lack of food available. So you can't always get the, the food when you're trying to sell and to fill up those boxes. There's a big lack of processing facilities where we are. There's people growing the food, there's people who want to eat the food, but there's no way of freezing it or canning it or processing it in a way that conserves it for the winter months. So this is something that we're really trying to work hard on. There's also a problem with access to capital. So as I mentioned before, a lot of these projects operate on a shoestring. Um, so we're trying to find creative ways um, through uh, cooperatives. We've, we're doing a lot of work on co-ops as an option for making these organizations more, uh, more viable and more sustainable in the long run economically. And there's also um, burnout. Volunteer burnout is a huge problem because a lot of these organizations rely very, very heavily on volunteers and that's an unfair burden to place on people. And then there's the market concentration. So we're trying really hard to make the food system different, but um, we're still not the dominant player in the food system. So there's market concentration. And I don't know, does anybody here know the group, et cetera? If you don't, you might want to look them up. They do some amazing, um, research on corporate concentration in terms of the food system and how it's all getting to be very um, increasingly still very much um, a system that's dominated by just a few uh, multinational corporations. Um, I'm just really quickly because I'm I think have I run out of time Vera? So that's fine. You can keep going. Okay I'll just Go through these really fast. Okay, so in addition, that's work that we're doing in Ontario. We're also taking that and doing versions of it in all the different nodes that I talked to you about. We also have something called a City Region Food Systems Project that we're involved in. Uh, it has to do with the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization and an urban agriculture, um, an international urban agriculture organization called RUAF. We have two cities in Zambia that are involved in the project, Quito. Colombia, Toronto, Utrecht, and Colombo in Sri Lanka. 
Um, we are also involved in agroecological and seed saving projects um, in Cuba, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Honduras. And um, we're, through these projects, interested particularly in building resilience uh, to climate change and diversity within the food system. So these are some of the takeaways that we can identify from what I've just talked to you about. There's a bunch of problems that everybody seems to face. It's like this whole globalization steamroller is creating very similar problems for communities everywhere. And what we've also realized is the solutions to these problems are very much based in the places that they need to be developed. However, that said, communities are really important to developing solutions, networks are important, and also good practices. So what we, one of the things that we've done through uh, the Center for Sustainable Food Systems is we've developed um, a community toolkit that communities can use to get a more sustainable food system launched in their, um, wherever it is that they live. And there's a bunch of case studies at the back of that that we've just updated. So we have probably 45 case studies in all. So if you're interested in that, I can point you to that um, on the internet. And then finally, we can't template this. And this drives, it's very difficult for people who are trying to develop policy to deal with this because we can't say to people in government, here's the answer, because it's different everywhere. And that makes it really, really difficult to deal with this from a policy perspective, and it requires um, creativity and an approach that, um, that recognizes the differences um, across space and time. So that's like lots of different potatoes. We planted potatoes this morning, so <laughs> there we go. And I'd just like to thank all of our sponsors. And thank you very much, Vera, for having me here. And I didn't put my email address. It's actually at the very beginning. So excuse me. Oh, there we go. It's right there. And Andrew's email address is there, too. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.